Hello and welcome to this online seminar of Head Acoustics on the assessment of audio quality. My name is Magnus Schäfer and I'm the researcher behind the multidimensional audio quality score, our novel instrumental assessment method for audio quality. In this online seminar, we'll take a look behind the scenes of MLEX. I will explain where we are coming from, what we learned along the way, and of course, we'll have a look at the final product. At the end of the seminar, we'll definitely have time for your questions and for some discussions. So let's get straight into it and have a look at the application scenarios that we are dealing with. What do we mean when we talk about audio systems? It's all types of systems that you use to listen to music. It's a car audio system. It's a home entertainment system with possibly multiple loudspeakers. Of course, it's headphones. And now let's assume you're the person to develop such a system or to test such a system. And you want to find out how good's the performance. If you did an algorithmic improvement, how much did I gain or did I maybe even lose something? And for this performance assessment, you usually have three possibilities. The first is a listening test. A listening test is very nice because you can directly capture the perception of a human listener. But a listening test is fairly slow. And for those algorithmic improvements or algorithmic changes, it's very, very cumbersome to always conduct a new listening test just to test if your parameter tuning worked. The second possibility are technical measurements. Things like measuring the frequency response, measuring harmonic distortion, stuff like that. That's very nice, but all of those measurements need to be interpreted by experts. So it's again something fairly difficult if you're doing a broad range of testing. And third stage, and that's where we are at now with MDEX, is instrumental evaluation. An instrumental evaluation tries to directly model the quality perception of a human listener. Accordingly, there is no expert interpretation necessary to understand the results. You get a rating scale, one end of the rating scale is bad, the other end of the, rating, of the rating scale is good. And you know where you stand with your system. And you can see if your algorithmic change was an improvement. This seminar basically goes along the way of development of MDAX. We'll first have a look at some stages of the auditory assessment. Because if we want to model human perception, we first need to learn how do humans perceive audio quality, what's important for a human listener. Then, with that knowledge, we can go into the instrumental assessment and try to design a system that mimics the perception of the human listener. And, of course, we'll finish with some results and an outlook to the next two weeks, because this seminar is the first in a series of three. So, let's go into the first stage. We want to collect auditory data. Practically speaking, we want to conduct listening tests that tell us something about human perception with respect to audio quality. As a company, we are fairly experienced in doing listening tests for stuff like speech quality, for stuff like noise reduction, for all types of other industrial applications. And if you look at the test methodologies, there is no shortage of test methodologies. You have absolute category rating, degradation category rating, Different types of listening tests even deal with different quality attributes. The question now is, how do these tests work for audio quality, for multi-channel systems, for our application scenario? These different quality attributes, do we have different quality attributes for audio quality? So we started with what we knew. We conducted a first auditory experiment. In this auditory experiment, we checked car audio systems. We had a fairly large auditory evaluation, 77 participants in several different environments. And the test that we did was a design that was often used in speech quality testing because we figured it's not that far off. We might learn something here. So it was an absolute category rating. The test subjects listened to a signal and then they rated it on a five point scale with one point being very bad and five points being very good. So what are the results of this test? For two of those environments, you can see the results here in this graph. And the different bars are different cars, different car audio systems. And what we can see is the quality range is really, really small. The worst system is about 2.5. The best system is 3.5. 
That's not a lot on this five point scale. So we're not really using the entire quality scale with this type of listening test. So obviously it's not applicable for assessing audio quality. Now the question of course is, what is useful in this scenario? And well, we listen to those signals and if you listen to the worst signal in the test and afterwards you listen to the best signal in the test, you hear a very, very, very clear difference. So the test design that we finally went for is a comparison category rating where you're listening to two different audio signals. It's always the same piece of music but played over two different audio systems. So in our case, the sound A could be the sound of one car and sound B would be the same signal played in another car. And we also thought about quality attributes. What is important for a human listener? In that first auditory evaluation, we asked our participants, well, what did you listen to? What was important for your quality perception? And they told us different things. And from their responses, and of course also from the literature on this topic, we figured three different individual quality attributes are important. The timbre of the sound, then the amount of distortions that are present, the spatial image that is painted by the recording, or so-called the immersiveness, how much you are immersed in an acoustical scene. And then finally, the fourth attribute would be the overall quality. And in this comparison category rating test, all of those four attributes were rated on a seven point scale, ranging from A is a lot better than B to B is a lot better than A in appropriate wordings for those individual attributes. With this design, we conducted numerous listening tests and those listening tests all were fairly similar. Well, their basic design was absolutely identical, but the signals were different. So in each test, we had six audio systems and we used six different musical signals from all genres, rock, pop, jazz, classical music, all kinds of stuff. And with that uh, number of audio systems and signals, you already get to a fairly large number of comparisons. So even for just six audio systems, our test subjects had to do 90 comparisons. So 90 of those uh, pages that you saw before. And um, the test was an individual listening test, so everybody could do this at his or her own pace. And our test subjects were all normal hearing and naive listeners. So no experts, no trained musicians, no um, people with a very deep understanding of audio quality, just regular consumers that would buy such an audio system that you want to test. And each test subject was given the chance to individually repeat a signal or repeat both signals if you were not sure with your rating. And all the signals were randomized individually for our test subjects. Due to this signal repetition, some people were very sure with their ratings. They listened to A once, they listened to B once, and then they could give ratings for all four attributes. Other people needed a few more checks and listening to a few details. So the test duration varied, varied fairly strongly between 45 and 90 minutes for the test subjects. There was a break in between, so nobody had to listen to music for 90 minutes straight. And um, now we do have listening test results for the three quality attributes, timbre, distortions and immersiveness, and also for the overall quality. In many cases, if you have individual attributes, the overall quality can already be predicted fairly well from those individual attributes. So that's something that's very easy to check here with our auditory data. So the question is, can those three attributes already explain the overall quality or are we missing something? Is there something, something else for the overall quality that we need to consider? As a first test, we took a linear regression approach and just said, optimize three factors, so something times timbre plus something times distortion plus something times immersive, immersiveness, and we're at the overall quality. And as you can see in this diagram here, the auditory results on the x-axis and the prediction with this very simple linear regression on the y-axis, that's nigh on perfect. So we can say, okay, those three quality attributes seem to capture 
everything that's relevant, at least for a naive listener, for overall quality quite well. Uh, don't remember those numbers. The final product, MDAX, uses a more sophisticated and more powerful approach than this. Um, it's a trained regression with the possibility to check for non-linearities and uh, more interaction between the quality dimensions. So this is just for illustration purposes. Okay, now we do have auditory data. We have captured the perception of human listeners. We have captured their preferences. We have captured what they like, what they don't like. Now we want to go towards instrumental assessment. We want to use this auditory data for our product. And well, a generic instrumental assessment system always looks like this. You have some sort of recordings, can be music, can be speech, can be specific measurement signals. It goes into some black box, the assessment system, and returns a quality score. Within this system, we can use our listening test data for two things. First of all, we can use the information to develop analysis methods or analysis algorithms that relate to what the human listeners told us in the listening test. And secondly, we can use this auditory data to train a machine learning step to map the analysis results that we got to a quality scale. Because in the end, we want to have a score on a scale between one, which is very bad, and five, which is very good for your audio system. So those are the two stages that are relevant in the instrumental assessment where we can use the auditory data. Now let's have a closer look into the system design and what types of analyses we're using for our assessment system. This is a complete overview, a very rough overview, but a complete overview of the MDEX signal flow. We have two types of signals that we feed into the system. It's music signals, that's exactly the same songs that the participants were listening to in the listening test. And that's sweep signals. So swept sign signals for a range between 20, and 20, uh, 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. Those signals go into a joint pre-processing step, which deals with some simple stuff, sampling rate, alignment, level normalization, stuff like that. And then the more sophisticated elements are the three stages in the middle, the analysis stages for timbre, distortions, and immersiveness. All of those different quality attributes require different types of analysis because, of course, well, there are different attributes in the end. And there is some overlap, which we'll see in the following slides, but there's also fairly significant differences. And something that's that was very, very clear from the very first moment that we started analyzing these audio signals. There is no magical single analysis that will fully explain and capture everything that the humans perceived. So every analysis block that you see here is actually a group of different types of analysis or different versions of the same analysis. Let's have a closer look at Tumblr for, for the starters. It's five analysis that we have in that stage. And it's five analysis in all the stages, by the way. But it's five analysis here. And the first and the most important analysis here is the difference to a target frequency response. Based on the listening test results, we derived a preferred frequency response from our listeners. And that's something that we use in the algorithm. We measure the frequency response of the device that we want to test. We compare it to this target frequency response, get a quality value for that, and that is the most important metric in this, in this area for the timbre here. Then there's the spectral flux, which is a metric that indicates how the temporal structure of the signal is, re is reproduced by the audio system. And finally, there are three different versions of comparisons between the source signal and the recorded signal. There are some frequency bands which are obviously more important for a human listener when judging the quality of the system. And also there is the, the very last here in the list is a hearing model that was developed in-house that captures many of the capabilities and the phenomena that the human hearing system has to offer. Going to the next block, to the distortion, again, it's five metrics. And 
the difference to the target frequency response is here as well, which may be a bit of a surprise because the frequency response actually doesn't have anything to do with the distortion. But it can be seen here more like, well, it judges how important different aspects of the signal are. If a signal does not, uh, if a system does not even transmit any signal in a certain frequency range, of course, distortions in that frequency range are inaudible. They're not important for the, for the judgment. The other um, analysis here are closely related to stuff that you already know for other types of distortion analysis, things like harmonic distortion, signal modulation, and also when we are looking for nonlinearities in the transmission by analyzing the spectrogram of the sweep measurement in more detail. And finally, the stage four immersiveness, again, uses the same metric with a difference to the target frequency response. So just looking at the entire MDAX analysis group from a certain distance, you can say frequency response is the single most important parameter that we found for judging the performance of an audio system with the ears of a human listener. The immersiveness also has a look at the spectral flux. I said this is something about the temporal structure and of course the temporal structure is very important for the spatial perception because if you have certain time differences you perceive a sound as coming from a certain direction. Then there is one frequency band which is apparently very important for the human listeners. And finally there is two types of analysis that are based on a binaural hearing model which quantifies the spatial perception of a human listener. We'll have a closer look at that hearing model in a few slides. And I already mentioned that this target frequency response metric is the single most important one that we have in the entire group of analysis. So we'll have a look at that metric in more detail. What is a target frequency response? A target frequency response basically can be anything. You can be a manufacturer of audio systems and say we want our audio systems to have a lot of bass or we want our audio systems to have a lot of mids. We want to have them have the frequency response shaped in a certain way. What we mean when we talk about a target frequency response is the preferred frequency response of our human listeners in the listening test. This could be a flat spectrum. This could be some sort of a different target curve depending on your application. Maybe it's all also different for a headphone than for a car audio system. But what we are using here is the average target curve of all the different uh, cases that we had in our listening tests. But now we do have a slight issue. Because we had our test subjects listen to individual pieces of music. They did not listen to frequency response or to a white noise or to a sweep signal where you can directly identify the frequency response, at least uh, as a trained listener. So we have this yeah, issue. We can calculate the frequency response from the sweep measurement, but our test subjects judged it based on the music. So we need to have some sort of a relation between the sweep measurement and the music signal. And what we did for this is we had a look at the frequency response. What you see here is the frequency response for a certain audio system. You can see from frequencies above 200 hertz, the frequency response is fairly close to the target. So the values are fairly small, but there is no low frequencies. It's around 30 dB below the target frequency response for the lower end of the frequency scale. Not surprisingly, the device that we're testing here is a very small loudspeaker. It's not, not a big surprise that it, there is not a lot of low frequency content in the frequency response. But this difference would be completely identical for all pieces of music. And we saw in the listening test result that this device wasn't bad for all the signals. So why is that? If we now look at the music signal as a weighting factor and say, okay, only those parts of the frequency response are relevant for our analysis, which are actually used in this piece of music, then we get closer to the reality. Let's have a look at two different pieces of music. The first piece has a lot of low frequency content, a lot of bass, a lot of uh, low drum sounds, stuff like that. And you can see this difference at around 60, 70, 80 hertz 
is very, very important. The black curve now is the weighted version of the frequency response difference. So the dashed line on the top figure is the frequency response without the weighting. And the black line is now the weighting with the music signal that is actually played. And you can see this weighted version still has a large difference. So for this piece of music, a large difference can be observed. But if you have another piece of music, this is a piece of classical music. So a lot of piano sounds actually in this, in this particular piece, it's mostly a piano that's playing. A lot of mid-frequency stuff, very little on the lower end, very little on the upper end. And you can see in the black curve in the top figure, there are almost no differences left to perceive. And actually in the listening test, this audio system was rated fairly well for this piece of classical music. But it was very bad for that first piece of music, it was a piece of jazz. And so with this way of weighting the analysis results with the actual content of the music, we managed to get a better mapping between our listening test result and the performance of the analysis algorithm. And now I already mentioned that we'll have a look at the binaural hearing model, because that is something that is probably the most unusual type of analysis that one could use in such a context, or maybe the most unusual analysis for most of the, of the audience of this online seminar. And what we use here is a binaural hearing model. The binaural hearing model takes the signals from both ears and telling, saying it very simply, calculates a cross correlation between the two. So it looks at what's the timing difference between the ear signals and what's the amplitude difference between the ear signals. The way that this is calculated is like this. You have the two ear signals, which are first fed into a monaural ear model separately. Uh, this is a certain filter bank and a, a response model for the hair cells in the inner ear. And then you get a neural signal train. And those neural signal trains are then fed into a cross correlation, correlation stage. This cross correlation is just two delay lines, one coming from the left, one coming from the right. And then at each, each step of the delay line, the two values are multiplied and you get an output. There are some additional factors in there to better map this to human perception and some waiting stages which help in even better map it to human perception. But in the end, you get an output and the output is called a correlogram. A correlogram is cross-correlation over time. I will try to, to illustrate this with a, with a brief example. What we have here is a correlogram for audio, for car audio systems. So the input signal in this case is again the piece of classical music and you can see the structure of this correlogram, the original signal, in this plot. You see there is a certain type of temporal structure, so the time is starting at the top end of the figure and going to the bottom end. The signal has a length of about 10 seconds. And this lateralization axis can be read as sort of a directional axis. Lateralization is a value that is used if you're dealing with binaural perception in the brain, basically. But you could say a lateralization of minus 0 0.8 is 90 degrees to the left and a lateralization of 0 0.8 milliseconds is 90 degrees to the right. So this is a directional axis for all intents and purposes. Let's have a look at the two car audio systems. We have one with, with a fairly good performance because we see in the original piece of music, most of the energy is around a lateralization of 0, 0 milliseconds. So the signal is coming from the middle basically. As it has a certain temporal structure, there's a lot of energy between two and three seconds, and then a larger group of area of energy between five and eight seconds. So this is a car audio system which performed very well in our listening experiments. And you can see the temporal structure is fairly okay. The spatial structure is fairly good. Most of the signal is perceived as coming from the middle, which is actually not that simple with a car audio system because you have a a lot of speakers in a car and you have a very tricky acoustical environment. And that not all manufacturers can handle this environment as well can be seen with this car. So in this car, the spatial perception is all over the place. You have a lot of energy 
all the way on the left, all the way on the right, on the middle, the temporal structure is completely changed. And this, of course, was a car which was rated fairly poorly on the rating scale for immersion in our listening tests. So now we had a look at the listening tests that we conducted to understand what human perception is in this context. Then we went to the system design, had a closer look at some of the analysis that we're using. Finally, I'd like to give a very, very brief look at some results. And these are just example results for three different types of devices. Our quality scale is a mean opinion score scale, which is ranging from 1.0 as very, very bad to 5.0 as very, very good. And you have these four different mean opinion score values here. Of course, MOST is for Turnbura, MOSD is for distortion, MOSI is for immersiveness and MOSO is for the overall quality. Our three devices that we're looking at are very, very different. The first is a very small and portable Bluetooth speaker. The second is just a middle of the range bookshelf speaker that you could find in many home audio systems. And the last option is a high quality headphone. And you can see that the results for the MDEX analysis are very, very different. So the Bluetooth speaker, for example, is a very small device and it's just one device. So there is no spatial information that can be transferred with this device. Accordingly, the rating for immersiveness is very bad. The rating for timbre is even worse because the loudspeaker is not only small, it also sounds bad. But uh, the second device has a very specific characteristic. This bookshelf speaker is and something that I would personally confirm when listening to music with this device. It's fairly well tuned, so it sounds good. The frequency response is nice. Music just sounds good with this speaker. But there are some distortions and the immersiveness is not great because it's somewhat unprecise. These, the spatial image is a bit unclear. So this speaker gets a decent rating for Turnbull, but all the other ratings are not that, not that great. And finally, the high quality headphone just provides very good performance all around in all areas. With, this, with these three examples, I just would like to illustrate that MDEX can identify strength and also weaknesses of devices that are plausible, that relate to what we can see in the device, what we can expect from such a device. With that brief look, I would like to come to the end. We together had a look at MDEX. We looked at the results of the listening test, at the design of the listening test, and we saw how this instrumental assessment method is designed. We had a short look at the results. We did not really go into that much application reality. For that, you should tune in again next week and the week after that, because there will be two more um, seminars in this series. Next week, Jacob Sundegaard is going to talk about testing of headphones. And in the week after that, Janishov Karlis is going to talk about the testing of car audio systems. With that, I would like to conclude my seminar presentation and I'm looking forward to your questions and the discussion now. 